Hello, welcome to Alternative Views. We're very happy to have John Stockwell with us to discuss the implications of the election to the presidency of George Bush. We'll be discussing that with John today. John is a peace activist, a writer, a lecturer, an ex-CIA agent, and now a prominent critic of the CIA, who currently is working on two books, one on the Vietnam War and another on the arms race. He's also been commissioned by Oliver Stone to write a screenplay about Central America and has been very busy lecturing, traveling around the country, and doing research since we last saw him on Alternative Views. So welcome back, John. <laughs> My pleasure. And it looks like our crew didn't show up, so I'm going to have to do a camera, be a camera <laughs> operator for all three cameras as well as participate in this. Okay, well, jump in whenever you feel like it. Uh, man uh, of right. many talents. Right. This is like the old days. <laughs> So, John, I think everyone is concerned about what the election of George Bush will mean for American foreign and domestic policy and what a Bush presidency would be like. We're currently in the period, the honeymoon period, where all the media are just celebrating him, being nice to him, all the politicians are snookering up to him. So let's give a critical perspective on the Bush presidency that we really haven't heard from our uh, corrupt uh, mainstream media. It's a tough one. This is, of course, the, the calm before the storm, perhaps. We have so little to go on. The man's been a vice president, uh, uh, politician. Uh, the responsible people say, give him a break. Let's wait and see right. what he does. Uh, my own position, and then they say, well, he is such a chameleon, but he could go either way, so to speak. And they point out that he was historically more moderate than Reagan, who has always had a wild hair up his nose. But I personally am more of the school that I, I believe we do know a lot about this man. In fact, we know some things about him that are much more significant and frightening than what we knew about Ronald Reagan. Ronald Reagan was, of course, a committed conservative who, who, who was known to have a slightly defective mind. <laughs> Who and had proved pretty, that that was the case. And proved it and lived up to and had some harsh policies when he was governor of California. But Bush... Uh, the CIA directorship where he made these contacts, I worked for him. You know, I, I witnessed personally his supervising the CIA's covering up of illegal activity at the end of the Angola operation in early 1976. Uh, and he was actually fending off the hostile Congress. Instead of investigating and firing the perpetrators of crimes, he was fending off the FBI and the Congress on at least three or four major uh, CIA criminal activities. What and, were those activities? Well, one was the Angolan operation, where we had broken a number of laws, much like the Iran-Contra and the Bolan kind of laws. And then we had conspired to cover up the breaking of the laws. And I mean, literally, we sat around the big oak tables and discussed the law. We went down to the library and read up on the law. We, and then things like, uh, I remember one session reminding the boss, you know, don't contradict yourself. Last week you said, you know, don't contradict yourself. This week, if Senator so-and-so brings up a certain issue. And uh, this, this one, he just plowed right into that one. And he was just telling the Senate, you know, the Congress, I don't know, I wasn't here, but I'm sure that I just find it very difficult to believe, but we'll look into it thoroughly. If you'll just give me some slack. And he was reassuring them. And with, with, you know, him patting him on the head, they uh, backed off and just never got back to it. He was also doing the same thing about the assassination of Patrice Lumumba, which was being investigated uh, in that cycle. Uh, and also the Chilean operation, the killing of, you know, the track one, track two, uh, ouster and killing of uh, Salvador Allende in Chile. And he was fending off an investigation of that. Uh, on, in the FBI stuff, the Justice Department was investigating some of the mercenaries who had been involved in the CIA's Angola program. And they were asking us specifically which ones had worked for us and in what capacities. And uh, a young attorney showed up from the general counsel's office responding to Bush's uh, supervision policies and actually went through my files and purged documents that he thought would be legally incriminating if we were uh, subpoenaed, you know, if we were in investigated. And all of that was uh, a thorough indication of Bush's policies as I witnessed them. Beyond that, we have a, an incredible record that we'll get into in greater depth as we chat here now. 
of the connections that he picked up when he was CIA director. So we have not only Noriega, but we have uh, uh, a dozen or dozens of Noriegas uh, who have blackmail control of this man. Now, one would like to give anyone the benefit of a doubt and say, hopefully they're going to be more moderate, but this man even wished he to be uh, more moderate on CIA activities would have an uphill fight because that establishment has got so much dirt on him. And, and I personally don't believe he really has any desire or instincts to withdraw from them. I think he's I think he sees a secret world that, that goes back to that uh, skull and bones thing at Yale, that kind of uh, secret elite manipulation, the Knights of Malta. I think he's, uh, I think psychologically he's just deeply committed to a view of the world where there's uh, elite insiders who are well above the normal laws of, of man and God. You look and see who's been the heads of the CIA all these years, and it's been people who've been right up at the, at the top and intermingled, interlocked with the top people in the American power structure. It seems that uh, that's such an important part, running an intelligence uh, service, that the establishment to uh, people don't want any outsiders doing it. Well, what is the implication then of having an ex-CIA director, the President of the United States? This is the first time that this has ever happened, that someone who is so deeply involved in intelligence activities is actually the President. Well, it's a giant step towards the national security state is what it is. It's, it's a huge victory for the national security establishment. And always remember that although it's, it goes far beyond the CIA, but the CIA was created in the National Security Act of 1947. Uh, and the National Security Establishment has the CIA as the, so one of the inner chapters, so to speak. And to have one of its directors bought into the thing totally and controlled by all of the illegal activities that he's been privy to and part of, uh, it, it means just that. We, we've been watching and worrying and people have been writing books for 15 years about the national security state. And this is a giant step in that direction is what it amounts so to. So does that mean that the CIA will have much more influence in current uh, policy than they would have um, otherwise? And that Bush has this mentality, the sort of conspiratorial, covert action, interventionist uh, view of the world that these people um, have. How do you think that might translate practically into an increased role for the CIA or increased influence on both? You get into some nuances or personalities, if you will. Yeah. Overall, the establishment that the CIA represents is much stronger, having Bush as, uh, as president. Uh, however, it's difficult to imagine the CIA being more dominant and active than it was under William Casey for mm. the simple right reason that the man was wild, as he, you know, Wild Bill Casey. Right. And uh, he was running poorly thought out, very aggressive operations in every corner of the world. Now, Bush has decided to go with William Webster. Now, Webster is no saint. As the head of the CIA. As the head of the CIA, uh, which means... Right. Yes, uh -huh. which, which means the head of the intelligence community because the CIA director coordinates all of the intelligence right. in the seven uh, bureaucracies. Uh, Webster is no saint. It's not that, you know, that it makes you feel reassured. In fact, he ran COINTELPRO2 in the FBI under Reagan when they were harassing the people who were supporting the, the, the are lobbying against the Contras. And, uh, he, but what, what's the most ominous thing about this man is that the establishment uh, exonerated him totally. He was permitted by the Congress, by the establishment, by the, the, the Washington Post media uh, at the end of that thing when it was exposed of taking the idiots out, the stupidity out, the moron out of saying, well, it's true I was director of the FBI, but I wasn't aware of any of these activities. And, uh, you know, the Admiral's ship sinks, and he said, well, I wasn't aware it had a hole in the side. You this know, sounds like the Ronald Reagan uh, deficient management style was simply lying. And yeah. Bush, Bush used the same out. He sat in 17 meetings of the National Security Council in which they discussed the Iran-Contra scandal 
and he says he doesn't remember their ever having talked about it. There was also another interesting thing that he said when they asked him about Oliver North on one of the TV things. He said, well, they made two or three mistakes. Hmm. The fact that it was all illegal <laughs> never yeah. even no. phased him. It didn't make any difference. See, back to Webster, though, it's, it's interesting to note that uh, two levels of the, the intelligence or national security establishment, not the, the community, uh, the hard, you know, the professional, the paid professionals, the on-duty professionals, but the community has spoken out at two levels. Uh, one, uh, at the Henry Kissinger level, they've gotten together and published a paper in which they have spelled out uh, policies that, that Bush should follow. Uh, which which speak pretty openly of brutality towards the third world. Mm -hmm. And then at a level below that, uh, the Georgetown professors, where McFarlane went to work after he left the White House, where Ray Klein and others operate from, where they publish these books, the uh, intelligence requirements for the 80s, and now they've come out for the 90s. These people, Robert Gates, the former deputy director, these people have come out with uh, publications and statements uh, and, and radio interviews and whatnot, vigorously protesting Webster as CIA director because they say he is soft on covert action. He's not aggressive enough. Yet we know that Bush is such a believer in covert action that at least it's unlikely there'll be that much of a curtailing of covert uh, action. Well, it, uh, again, mm -hmm. it, we're getting into nuances. It, they're going to run operations, for mm -hmm. sure. Mm -hmm. It's a question of how many and how wild. And then right. you, at a certain point, you see, it's almost in the world's interest. God, God knows this is a, a perverse kind of logic, but it's almost in the world's interest to have a William uh, Casey as opposed to William Webster because Casey would go so far that he would self-destruct. Right. He was truly uh, uh, crazy, wild. Mm -hmm. And so these things would be exposed right. and there would be a reaction. The Congress would clash with him right. endlessly. He would mining the harbors and lie about it. Uh, whereas Webster is muting it with the Congress and building good relations. And by having a little bit better judgment, he may actually accomplish more in the long run and it may be harder for us to crack it open. John, could you go into some more detail on this blackmail theme of how Bush might be subject to blackmail because of his involvement in the CIA and in other activities during the Reagan administration? What would be an example of this and how would such uh, blackmail work? Well, let's go into the most uh, uh, obvious uh, case that we know of, the one that we have the best documented so far. Uh, and this is this Black Eagle thing that was started in, uh, in 82. Uh, essentially, in a re reversal of role. roles, the CI is actually created to give the White House and the executive uh, plausible deniability so they can keep clean and if the CIA does something wrong they can you know well we didn't know about it and they can fire the CIA's director. William Casey reversed this policy and it was actually quite clever uh, in, in retrospect in the Iran-Contra thing. He initiated the, the Iran-Contra thing but he managed to have Ronald Reagan and the White House take the heat for it. He ran it through Oliver North so it became a political thing, whereas the CIA was clearly under the thumb of the Congress, or should have been, or legally was. But he also, this Black Eagle operation of, of delivering arms to the, to the Contras, uh, uh, he got George Bush to front for that, to use the vice president's office to front for that. And Bush was a very activist vice president, running this, this, uh, uh, this thing they had on anti-terrorism, supposedly, which is, of course, 1984 doublespeak for, you know, running terrorist activities, mm -hmm. smuggling arms. And uh, through that operation, they began to work through Panama and the planes flying through Panama, and Noriega gave them access to the airstrips that they needed and immediately began working the other end of the line through the Medellin using the same Black Eagle planes to fly drugs up here into the United States. And uh, Bush was, his office was, was fronting, was running this thing. Now, obviously, they tried to maintain what I thought was a very thin, implausible deniability. 
of having Don Gregg running the thing right out of uh, George Bush's office with his, his uh, assistant, what's his name, Samuel Watson, uh, and then Felix Rodriguez down in El Salvador, and then a network that went throughout, planes flying throughout, Southern Air Transport involved, their own airplanes involved, and, and yet the, the only deniability was uh, Greg saying, well, I never told uh, the Bush, vice president yeah. about all of these things which is utterly impossible. Mm -hmm. It is not within the realm of human, uh, unless the person were a Ronald Reagan, mm -hmm. and even then he would have had to have known what, what Greg was doing. Can you give us a little background on Greg, the fact that he and Bush had been together in the CIA uh, and buddies for a long time? Yeah, Greg was uh, 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 not an original. I think he came into the CIA in 51, a graduate of Williams College. At, at the height, you know, that was getting into the the, the McCarthy era, the height of conservatism, the, the Korean War, a very, very conservative era, and and he, and he joined uh, and and had a, what you know was ultimately a tremendously successful career. In fact, I thought that Bush would wind up appointing him as a CIA director, uh, and instead he's gone with uh, William Webster. Uh, the guy had to do with the destabilization of Cuba in the 60s. He wound up in Vietnam in military region three in 1970, and that's the, you know where I was. Except I didn't overlap with him, but I got there just after he had left. So uh, there were a lot of people were talking about him, and about Felix Rodriguez, who was one of his favorite uh, operatives in, in Vietnam the height of the Phoenix program. And Felix. Shackley was his boss, wasn't he? And Shackley was the boss. So That's you right. see the same group uh, moving in with uh, George Bush then in the basement of the White House, minus right next door to old Oliver North. Minus office. Shackley. <laughs> Shackley wasn't. Yeah, minus Shackley, who had mm -hmm. been squeezed out right. by then. But, but Shackley uh, was still in operation, in, in involved in a lot of these things. Well, I'm sure the old boy thing works so that he was in contact with them. But don't ever forget that these people fight a lot. They're, they are, are, are as bad as people in the peace movement, about 12, <laughs> literally. Uh, you remember when Black Eagle eventually uh, fell apart. Uh, and then the the enterprise kind of came apart. It, Oliver North and Felix Rodriguez were at each other's throats, mm -hmm. and these are two very volatile, volatile unstable, uh, dangerous uh, men uh, who couldn't get along. You remember the the incident that cited in the foreign policy fall '88 uh, issue uh, that broke Black Eagle was when the CIA operatives it doesn't name them. Mm -hmm. Uh, and the Israeli operatives drew their pistols on each other. This was 1985. 85. Wow. Mm -hmm. And they were about to start blasting each other away. And the senior head said, "Everybody, cool. It just, you know, slow down." And prevailed and got everybody to put their guns back. And at the same time, the Pollard case was breaking, and the U.S. was going to prosecute the Pollards, and Israel didn't appreciate that. So it Who had been its spying for Israel and against the United States. Right. And. Yeah. Can you clarify something, may, or are you through with it? What you're no, doing? there's okay. so much of this material. Uh, yeah. I'm a bit confused. Now, uh, Oliver North's office was next door to George Bush and Donald Gregg's in the bottom of the White House, as I understand it. Now, were they working together, or as, as I've heard some people say, they actually had two separate arms running and drug smuggling operations going? Or were they separate but coordinated? Well, uh, it, you know, they have done everything they could to obfuscate, if you will, and confuse the issue. North admitted that he was he met with uh, Bush on many occasions, but he minimized the cooperation. Uh, the, the way I see it is uh, there were a number of different offices, and people did have different roles to play, and there were different power lines working. And don't ever forget that there is a, a, just a norm of every presidency since I've been around anyway, is a lot of intense competitiveness. I mean, people, they're really ruthless. Everybody's jockeying for position endlessly inside the White House and the vice president's office if he has any power. Uh, so, so North was definitely part of the same uh, machinery. He was definitely cooperating with George Bush as, as Bush was cooperating with Casey. But at the same time, North was definitely beating his own drum and, and, and tooting his own horn and flying around the world grandstanding and, and setting his... 
they were not what you know it was not a disciplined unit like one CIA office would be or or one marine division would be or one uh, one of your navy ships would be and these are a lot of competing people who are in the same uh, ideology the same administration uh, and and moving in the same direction with the same uh, evil intention the, the, the way that the uh, Rolling Stone uh, told this story in their November 3rd essay on the dirty secrets of George Bush the um, Black Eagle operation that Bush, Rodriguez, and Greg were running was coming apart because of this rupture with the um, Israelis and also because they found out Noriega was running so many drugs that this was threatening the integrity of the uh, operation. So North began this other enterprise, literally called the Enterprise, with uh, Richard Secord and Hakeem and these people to bring uh, arms down to the Contras. But uh, Secord had trouble getting it off so that Felix Rodriguez began another um, operation and once uh, Secord got his going they shut down the, the operation with Rodriguez's Cuban friends who had lost a lot of money in this and were very angry and this began the tension between Rodriguez and um, uh, Bush and the Secord North um, uh, group and eventually uh, the tensions there sort of exploded and Bush was the guy supposedly trying to hold everything together that when these other guys North and Rodriguez were at each other's throats, Bush was the guy that had to smooth things over. So again, he played a major role in uh, carrying out these operations, according at least to these, uh, this Rolling Stone story that seemed fairly well documented. No, I, I endorse it the way, the way you describe it as the way I have, uh, I have read it myself mm -hmm. very much. Mm -hmm. That, uh, in fact, the, the, the one, the original uh, outfit, they had built this giant warehouse called the Arms Supermarket and stocked it uh, with arms which was supposed to be bought by the Contras with the U.S. taxpayers' dollars or the private enterprise dollars. And, and uh, at the time that, that North pulled away from that, that enterprise to start the enterprise, they had that thing stocked with $18 million worth of arms. Now, you know, arms is a cash for business. And this cash had to come from the Medellin Colombian cocaine cartel. Right. So there was drug money that they had been working with that had stocked this warehouse, counting on selling the arms to the to the enterprise Smalley. To the to, and then North did break away at the point where he saw that thing apparently as getting out of control, as being too explosive. Now it was not. Don't anyone misunderstand that he was morally troubled by working with people who were smuggling drugs. He had known for years these people were smuggling drugs. But as, as you noted, the volume of it was getting so high that he saw an, an, an earthquake coming and actually moved. There also was undoubtedly uh, uh, part of his ego, power play, power struggle at the level of him and Rodriguez, at the level perhaps of him and, and uh, 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 Greg. During this whole time, George Bush was supervisor. He was control of the drug anti-drug program in the United States, not just the propaganda bit, you know, just say no, but a great opera and, and very expensive operation to interdict drugs and to keep them from coming into the United States. So it was a perfect circle, <laughs> not only from the propaganda point of view, because Bush could be said to be the guy who is keeping it from coming in, but on the covert aspect, he could make sure that this stuff came in undetected and, and yet, none of these stories uh, came out during the election uh, campaign. When I left for Europe uh, on uh, August the 17th, during the Republican convention, Dukakis was 10 or 15 points ahead. Bush had just nominated Quayle, chosen Quayle, as vice president. That looked like it was going to be a self-destruct operation. And when I came back a month later, Bush was 10 points ahead. How, what do you make of this? How do you analyze Bush is turning things around and winning the presidency. What was involved in this? Well, one just quick observation is there's a false, f some false mm -hmm. polling in mm -hmm. the summer. After the Democratic convention, uh, the Democrats always look better. They've gotten a lot of publicity. And then a month later, after the Republican convention, they have a surge back. And so right. it's sometime about the 1st of September where the polls, I, I think, I forget the figure, but it's something like nine times out of ten, mm -hmm. the one who is leading on the 1st of September wins. Right. So it's stabilized by the end of August. 
And in fact, by the end of August, Bush was ahead again. The quail thing was a heavy hit uh, of Bush. Uh, it, one might call it a major blunder, but since he succeeded, uh, we all reflected on that a lot. His choice of quail, as I see it, was twofold. He had to pick someone who would make him look like a giant. <laughs> and that was not easy to do. <laughs> if he picked uh, Bob Dole, right. for example, right. someone who knew, knew more and had a, a stronger personality, right. uh, he would have all kinds of problems. He also, in my opinion, and this is an analyst's opinion, you know, this is not based on any hard quotes or anything, very subjective, but he also had to pick someone who was uh, uh, bought into the Iran-Contra scandal. And Quayle was. He was the senator from Indiana. And Indiana is the state that John Hull, you know, came from, who was the man who had the ranch in Costa Rica from which all the drug smuggling and the arms, you know, from the southern side of the Contra thing had been run. And it turns out, as we dug up in August and found out, it, 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 this uh, young man uh, working for Quayle introduced Hull to Oliver North originally, and that young man's name was Robert Owens. And, and Owens so was involved in all this? Quayle, Owens was working oh for, for Quayle when he that introduced John Hull. Oh, yes, when he introduced oh. John Hull to Oliver North and gave them that whole option which evolved into the enterprise and, and the whole scandal. For That's doing. incredible. The whole interconnections, all of this, yeah. inter even quail. I mean, this is so you uh, see, amazing. What, what, uh, to go back, this is a very complicated thing, but mm -hmm. I think we can sort it out. Uh, I don't think Bush dared to have someone in office who was clean of the Iran-Contra thing, like Dole, mm. who could benefit from an impeachment. So he needed someone that would be tainted enough with the Iran-Contra uh, that they would be forced to resign at the uh, same time. They would be impeached with him, who could not possibly benefit from his impeachment. He needed to create a situation to protect where, himself. where the establishment couldn't shunt him aside and put in a strong figure like uh, Dole or, or Howard Baker, mm -hmm. who would be very acceptable to the public and to the establishment. Right, and that's uh, uh, that's where that's where Quayle that's where Quayle came, and that Barbara Honiger, uh, who who is not the world's greatest analyst, but she certainly has a lot of fire and imagination, and she coined the phrase. Uh, that he was, uh, Quayle was Bush's impeachment insurance. Right. Uh, who, who was she? Can you tell us who Barbara was? Barbara Honiger uh, worked for the Bush-Reagan campaign in 1980 and then quit in, in, in a volatile protest of, uh, of, uh, of their activities and uh, has made a crusade out of exposing the October surprise. We might as well get into this since uh, this is one of the stories that was <clears throat> covered over by the mainstream um, uh, media. What was her initial story? Well, her initial story was that uh, the Reagan-Bush campaign, William mm -hmm. Casey, the Reagan-Bush campaign mm -hmm. had made a deal with the Iranians to keep the embassy hostage right. through the elections and then another 76 days so that Carter wouldn't even get credit for their release, you know, so that Reagan would get the full credit for their release. Right. And they were, in fact, released two hours after he was sworn in, which right. was enough time for the word to get back to Iran that he was, in fact, president. And then, mm -hmm. uh, he, you know, they were, the, the hostages were released. They were actually held at the airport mm -hmm. waiting for this confirmation. And then to go back to our other thing we were working on here mm -hmm. is why didn't Dukakis take Bush's head off with right. this stuff? Which right. he could have. God knows you can see the television mm -hmm. commercials or shows, you know, our interview of five minute segments showing the Noriega link, the Black Eagle, the whole stuff mm -hmm. we had all of this. Right. And we were definitely trying to feed it to them. Right. And uh, what what uh, what we got back from them was this is from the Dukakis from campaign. the Dukakis, okay. and we got inside. We right. got uh, we got the, we got the movie cover up delivered to them. Right. We got the movie, uh, the PBS Frontline show, Guns, Drugs, and the CIA delivered right. to them. Uh, we got in to see them. Some of the people in this broad, disorganized group of, of scholars researching this thing. Uh, and we, we, we got from them uh, a, a resistance. They, they, they essentially, and feedback, uh, as one of the, the senior Dukakis people 
told Jim Driscoll, who's in our community with the America's Peace Test in Nevada, that John Stockpole's facts are all screwed up. And, and uh, I, you know, I immediately, what facts? What is it? Because I, mm -hmm. I consider myself, if not an academic, nevertheless a scholar of these right. things. And so what facts? Because I want to check them out. Because mm -hmm. I, if I am screwed right. up, I don't, you know, I don't. Right. And uh, they, w they wouldn't give us any details, but they just rejected the stuff out of hand. Now, if you'll permit me just very quickly to create a, a, a scenario or give you my analysis Please. of what happened. And we note the scandal broke or was broken by the establishment in November of 86, the Iran-Contra scandal, and it led to, to a dismantling of the Reagan White House. And then later they gave him his credibility back with the INF agreement. Now, in the, the winter of 1987, the, the George Bush was written up by, by every major columnist as being out of business. He was finished politically. They were saying this openly. George Will was writing columns uh, that the Republican Party was out. The Democrats were clearly going to win the next time around, and they were all writing that George Bush could not survive the Iran-Contra scandal. And this is because they, including the conservative columnists and the establishment press, had this material back then, right? And they knew about George Bush's involvement in all of this stuff, right? And the scandal was breaking, and they did not believe that he could survive, right? By the spring, he had survived to the point battling, as I as I put it, to, to stay out of jail. Right. He had hung in there. He didn't resign or retire, and they began to wonder what the U.S. Um, uh, people's tolerance was of this scandal, how much it would stick. Then they engineered the Iran-Contra hearings in the summer, which were carefully orchestrated by Dan Inouye, the Democrat, right. uh, in cooperation with the other Democrats. Cohen and Mitchell, for example, wrote the book Men of Zeal, right. which they profess to be an expose of behind the scenes, but they do not, in fact, expose. It's a continuation of the cover-up. Right. They do not, for example, discuss their resistance at having... Uh, of allowing the Black Eagle stuff to be investigated right. and their, their own resistance of having the George Bush drug linkage investigated. So the committee drew a line and said we won't investigate beyond this line. So they gave the nation the appearance of an airing and they did not in fact probe into the things that would have led them into the impeachment of George Bush. And this had a catharsis effect on the nation. And then we get into the, the, the fall and then the winter of 88 and then the spring, and there's still a debate going on in public. Remember Dan Rather, who, who tried to nail Bush. Right. He tried to break this stuff and into the And that special open. CBS interview. And what happened was the establishment came down on him and mm -hmm. said, no, we, you know, we're not going to go after George Bush. Until eventually, in the summer of 88, when we were once again trying to break this, Bush eventually was able to laugh at the cameras at the Republican convention because we had journalists, I mean we had, had found journalists who would ask the questions, who went up on national television and said, what about the Iran-Contra thing? And he just laughed at them and said, I'm not even going to answer those questions anymore. The nation doesn't care about the Iran-Contra scandal. That is history. I've answered those questions. Forget it. Don't ask me anymore. Now, in the meantime, this establishment, this party, uh, that we have the single party state, this fraternity that runs this country that has two chapters, a Republican and a Democrat, one a little bit more uh, liberal than the other one, one more conservative representing the, the big business interests more directly, that's the Republicans. In terms of their interests, that's the A team. But they always have the B team that they can run out, a Jimmy Carter when uh, Richard Nixon makes the nation too angry or the nation gets too riled at the Vietnam War or something like that. This is where they produced Michael Dukakis. He's a team player to the establishment. Uh, in order to be accepted as a presidential candidate, he did homage to the, to the arms race. Uh, he said eventually that he would give uh, humanitarian aid to the Contras. He would consider it. He said definitely he would give 
uh, military aid to El Salvador, which means he bought into all the principles of the covert secret government, of the covert operations, of the covert manipulation of the world. He was singing and another song when he was trying to get the Democratic nomination. That's right. Before, his background was progressive, but he, he bought in, they screened him into the system, they groomed him into the system. He was advised that he could run, but if he would... So what he was there is he, if the nation had clung, had its outrage had been sufficient over the Iran-Contra scandal, they had Dukakis standing by, the B team to their interests, uh, and he would give them some grief by spending some money on housing and on, on medical insurance for people and things like that. Uh, which is not their choice of the way to invest the money. They want to invest it in missiles and things where they make greater profits. But he would support the arms race, and he would support the CIA and the, the covert establishment, the National Security State's activities. But then they realized they did not have to go with the B-team. The people didn't care. They didn't have to give the, the nation a B-team. So they went ahead and went with the A-team, which was George Bush, i.e., they concluded eventually that they could Teflonize Bush despite all of this incredible activity and sell him to the nation, and they did. Mm. Why, though, did Dukakis, as the B team, not go after Bush more aggressively? Because he's a member of the team. He's a member of the fraternity. Mm -hmm. Why did Dan Inouye? They had, they had Ronald Reagan and George Bush by the short hairs. They could have impeached them, mm -hmm. and they didn't because they couldn't impeach a popular president like Reagan and Bush without losing control the public trust. Mm. See, this gets back into the Howard Zinn thesis that the, the American Revolution occurred when the rich white people, rich white males over here, wanted to take power away from the same element in England, and they engineered a deal with the people whereby they would give more freedom to the people than they had under the monarchy or the colony. Uh, but nevertheless, the rich white males would retain control. And, and this, this dynamic relationship, we don't have a democracy. We do not, even to this day, uh, vote for the president. We vote for electors uh, who select the president. In addition to which, this two-party system we've evolved gives them further control because even the selection of the candidates, it's done by about 50% vote a popular vote through the primaries and about 50 percent uh, through the frozen delegates or the hard delegates or the super delegates who are party hacks who control you know the party machinery controlling ultimately uh, who gets nominated this is why Pat Schroeder uh, gave it a run and dropped out is because her traveling and consulting with the super delegates, the frozen delegates, the power structure of the party, she was told she would not be permitted to win whatever ha happened, you know, on the popular side of things. And then once that was decided, she, you know, the money was not available to her. Now this system, as it, con as it has continued for 200 years, is a tenuous relationship in which the people who own the country, the people on the, you know, who, who the Federal Reserve Board, the people who manage the money and, and the moneyed interest, the strength of the capitalist system, uh, these people uh, uh, know that they're riding a potentially rebellious horse in the American people whose interests are not being fully served. A uh, myth has to be maintained to make this thing run. And it's a constant balance of what do they have to give the people to keep them on board the system and at what point are they going to lose the system. You read the history through Zen's eyes of the United States, or, or the Graham and uh, Grum book on, on the history of violence in the United States, and you see that every time the people have become angry enough, the system has yielded to them. The labor struggles at the turn of the century, for example, uh, the Vietnam War and Civil Rights days, uh, when blacks rose up in the country with a massive boycott and it began to really hurt the economic interests. You start uh, burning down the, uh, <laughs> the small businesses in the ghettos. And the white, white businesses White businesses and <laughs> Detroit and Watts and 14th Street in Washington. And, you know, when the, when the nation, when the system was breaking apart, the establishment yielded every time. And the system self-destructed. The cynicism of the Reagan years in which one, one of the more dramatic transfers of wealth from the poor to the rich occurred, you know, was orchestrated by Ronald Reagan. 
uh, through the arms race, the $2 trillion on arms, the mechanisms uh, that he set up for him, the rigging of, of the taxes where he could say taxes had been cut when they had been redistributed to hurt the, the middle class and poor uh, more. This thing came to a head under the Iran-Contra scandal. And once again, the establishment was faced in, in the winter of 87. They were saying, you know, we've had it, the people, the people have had it, and we're going to have to give them the Democrats for a while. Uh, and they came up eventually with, with what was to them a brilliant, the perfect candidate was Dukakis, who had a reputation of being clean after the corruption of the Reagan years, who had a reputation of being somewhat of a populist, as Jimmy Carter did. Uh, who could be sold to, as a cleansing, sort of, as a, here, you know, we sympathize here, you, you're, you can have your president for a while. The truth is that, that Jimmy Carter had foisted upon him uh, Zbig, Brzezinski, you know, who was an utter fascist in his policies to control the national security decisions. So Carter's human rights stuff couldn't go too far, and he wound up setting in motion uh, the arms buildup that eventually evolved into the Reagan arms buildup, which is the biggest peacetime buildup in the history of well, the biggest buildup in the arms buildup in the history of the world. And Brzezinski moved into the Bush camp uh, during this campaign. Oh, <laughs> indeed, and, uh, and and of course that's part of the October uh, the election held hostage. The the uh, Playboy article brings that out very clearly. is that having put, uh, he doesn't get into there, having put uh, uh, Carter in, in office to placate the people after Nixon, after Vietnam, uh, after the civil rights struggle, that Zen gets into that. But they're taking it up at the time of, at the end of the Carter era, era where two things had happened. One is the Federal Reserve Board cooked the economy. And uh, so we had runaway inflation, which would scare people. You could feel it, you could taste it, and the newspapers talked about it every day and blamed it on Carter. And when, when he doesn't control the stuff, the Federal Reserve Board right. does. And then the other thing was the national security establishment went after him with a passion. The CIA operatives cooperating with Bush Reagan uh, during the presidential campaign of 1980, the Pentagon cooperating, McFarlane, their Marine officer working in the State Department advising, but having committed himself uh, to the Bush side, all of these, these tendrils go back to the, the security establishment saying, okay, we've given them Carter for four years, now let's get back to work. And they got, they got Reagan in there. To summarize, they got Reagan in there, and he eventually self-destructed or the system self-destructed under his watch. They thought they were going to have to give us Dukakis uh, to placate the people, and then they found that the people simply don't care enough. The people simply aren't vigilant enough of their own interests to care enough about this monumental corruption from George Bush and, and the people around him, and they were able to continue with the A-team in office with George Bush to extend and continue the policies of Ronald Reagan to exploit the nation, and to, to keep in lockstep with the drug runners, not to mention the military machinery. I think yeah, that's an excellent analysis of how the establishment would view the two different uh, candidates and why they would then decide that they could pull behind Bush and go with what you call the A-team again. It still doesn't completely explain why the B-team, that is Dukakis and the Democrats, didn't fight harder for the presidency, didn't go after Bush more aggressively on this Noriega drugs, Contra drugs, the um, Iran um, arms deals, the whole relationships of Bush and Reagan to the Ayatollahs. Why didn't Dukakis and the Democrats use these issues to probably win the election if they could have uh, publicized them? It was the negative campaign of Bush against Dukakis that uh, many people think helped win it for Bush. Couldn't uh, Dukakis have done an honest <laughs> negative campaign against Bush, telling the actual truth about Bush? And why didn't he? I still have trouble. Of course, well, of course. The, that, uh, the Reagan administration is the most corrupt in the history of the country. They've had, what, a, almost 200 uh, people either indicted or in jail for corruption in this High administration? Official. And the Democrats didn't go after this corruption didn't mention issue. It. Why? Well, th this again gets back to the decision they made. I mean, 
we can only cite what they did and then it speaks for itself Dan Inouye running this committee a Democrat you know made it a joint thing and then the Democrats shut up and let the Republicans use it as a forum to advance the national security state the CIA's activities the Contra program instead of exposing the corruption that's where the decision was made Dukakis is just another member of the team mm. Whatever economic miracle supposedly occurred in Massachusetts under his governorship was done in great part with defense expenditures. He is bought into the system. He's a member of the team. With the establishment, as, as we know, as we've observed, I remember talking to Les Kurtz about this when he was uh, uh, developing the draft of his book, The, 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 the Nuclear Cage, uh, and we were talking about the, the military and in industrial the Iron Triangle, the military industrial complex, the defense corporations, the Pentagon, and the Congress. And then we took it a step further. Of course, it includes the media. As everyone well knows, the point of alternative views is that the media is owned, literally, by the same people who own the, you know, the defense corporations. But then we took it a step further. It's not even a, a quadrangle. It's, it's a pentad or a pentagon. Uh, because you also have the universities, the educational system, mm -hmm. in which the defense corporations and the Pentagon are careful to invest heavily. Seventy percent of some of these big universities' budgets come from, from defense you know, money. So the professors are paid for, the salaries are paid for uh, by the defense complex, and well, so they're bought into the system. So you have mm -hmm. that power structure and control, and that power structure determined not to let the system be destroyed or be weakened, even at the price of their own... Uh, let me put it this way. Jimmy Carter, for example, he, he demonstrated this, this, what I would call, misdirected uh, loyalty. After the 1980 thing, he did not go public and, and protest the Iran-Contra deal. Mm -hmm. He did not protest it in October when he had these reports coming in because he didn't want to destroy the system of which he was part. To go back to another era, 1960, uh, Richard Nixon lost to John Kennedy in a very close election, which turned in part on, on Mayor Daley in Chicago, counting every grave in Chicago twice. <laughs> now, this scandal was known at the time. Nixon didn't mention it until, God knows, 20 years later. He eventually said I, he couldn't. He couldn't make an issue out of, without uh, destroying the credibility of the presidential election process, and he wanted to have another shot at the presidency. Which he got. If, which he got and became president. If he had destroyed or attacked the system, if he had exposed that scandal, it would have destroyed perhaps. It wouldn't take all that much to, to lead the American people to have a big mental breakthrough and demand a change in the system, perhaps in the direction of a parliamentary system where we could at the time of an Iran-Contra scandal, there would be forced uh, a vote of confidence. And Reagan certainly would have been out. In, in, in December of 80, uh, 86, he would have been out. Without well, this question. is uh, my studies on the power structure in the mass media. This is the main thing they try to keep from the American public, how the economic and political system really works. Mm -hmm because the Americans wouldn't like that at all if they really, if they really knew. You saw how scared the establishment dodged a bullet, how scared they got in the, in the Jackson run at the presidency this last time, because Jackson is the first uh, national prominent figure uh, since I can remember who has, who, who has achieved prominence and represents the interests of the people pretty directly. And the, the manipulations they had to go through to keep him from getting a position of, of in fact, power. Just to cite one example of how far they will go, we, we this, this loose association of exes from the national security, we were flying to Iowa uh, to do a hearing to try to force the candidates to tell us their policies. This by, at that point, there were a lot of candidates. And on, on the plane, the day we went up there, the New York Times had a big piece on where the polls put all the candidates at that time in Iowa. And uh, it, had, it had Simon, I think, was leading in a big front page article. And, and then a long discussion, Simon and Dukakis and the others and whatnot. And then you went to page three for the bigger article, the details. And it turns out Jesse Jackson was running a very close second. It was sort of like 33 to 31 
but his name was not mentioned on the front page of the New York Times. Well, the Times. In, inside they uh, showed the polls, but on the front page mm -hmm. they didn't want him to have the name recognition. Well, the Times and all the mainstream media pretty much did a blackout on the, uh, excuse the metaphor, on the Jackson uh, campaign until the Super Tuesday primaries where he won, and then he became ahead actually after the Michigan uh, primaries. He was the front runner, and then they had to give some attention to Jackson, and they tried to make it uh, negative, and then Dukakis regained the momentum in the uh, Pennsylvania, New York uh, primaries. The so party, that was probably the only hope, looking back. The party machinery that, uh, shifted gears at that mm -hmm. time, scared, because mm -hmm. Jackson was leading, and there was a chance that the people would really get excited about right. this thing, and that 50% control asserted itself. The party machinery asserted itself and Jackson was, was pushed down and Dukakis was run in instead. They did it by calling Jackson a radical. Mm -hmm. They said it's not racial, we have no problem with his skin color, although there would be some people in the South who wouldn't vote for him, but he's a radical, meaning he doesn't support the establishment. And they got that word out to the party, to, you know, to the party hacks throughout the nation, and the result is that Jackson's... Uh, I've been wishing and hoping, like what you said, that uh, Jackson would split off and give us a third party. And with the, with the people that I believe would follow him, we might be able to force onto the two-party system a viable third party. And then we could you know, throw our block of votes to the right or the left, depending on who would give us the most real concessions. I don't think Jackson will ever get these concessions from the Democratic Party, which is where he's trying to. I noticed uh, the election night. I flipped on one channel, I think it was uh, NBC, and the analyst was saying, well, the reason the caucus lost was because uh, Jackson spoke out for him. And then I immediately turned to the next channel, which was ABC, and that pundit was saying, well, the reason he lost was because Jackson refused to support him. <laughs> which was total nonsense. <laughs> yeah. Jackson was traveling all over the country, yeah. literally every day, campaigning, mm -hmm. you know, ten things a day he was doing, or, you know, many. No, and then this was followed up, I saw it, a big Newsweek uh, article analyzing the election, and it said, well, they were looking at the prospects for the future, and they said the only thing the Democrats can do is to go with people like Gary Robb, who are conservatives, okay. so that the Democrats can move to the right. They said the worst thing they could do would be go Jesse Jackson because it would tear apart the Democratic uh, Party and destroy it. <laughs> well, it was, every election with these centrist yeah. liberals like Mondale yeah. and um, uh, Dukakis. But you were talking about the Democrats, isn't there another problem which the Democrats had, and that is they went lockstep right along with Reagan, Reaganomics, and providing money for the Contras. Arms the whole build bit. Up. Arms build Absolutely. Up. See, the arms build up, for example, the money, that, the power structure that keeps the Democrats in office, the ones that are in office, uh, uh, th th this is Reaganomics paid off enormously for them. Now the, you 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 do get into a lot of individual struggles and and infighting and and you know the system it isn't monolithic it isn't uh, 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 the 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 controllers of the country being in lockstep not at all. Some of them actually jump out of uh, the windows of their office buildings in New York committing suicide on occasion. It's, there's a lot of tugging and pulling, but nevertheless, when the chips are down, the establishment will, will not go for the juggler vein, their own juggler vein, if you will. They will cooperate in a cover-up. Howard Baker, you know, going in to straighten out the Reagan White House, thereby perhaps forever abandoning his shot at the presidency. Uh, uh, Nixon, you know, refusing to expose the scandal. Jimmy Carter refusing to expose the scandal. And Dukakis is the same Dukakis thing. Dukakis refusing to expose the scandal. Lyndon Johnson's behavior after they'd killed John Kennedy. The Warren Commission, a cover-up, you know, let's right. get back to business as usual, let's calm the nation down. Let's not take the, the scab off the wound, you know, and let the people see. Let's, let's paper it over and cover it up and put a bandage on it and get on with business as usual. Well, because of what's at stake mm -hmm. is the viability of the system for them. For them. So to draw a conclusion, to wrap up our uh, discussion today, it would seem that we really can't expect from the Democrats or the media any real exposures of the scandals and corruption of the system, any real important efforts to change or reform or transform the system. It really depends on the people that we're the only active agents of change, that it depends on alternative media, alternative 
socially critical progressive researchers to dig this dirt up that this is sort of our obligation, that if change is going to happen, it's not going to come from the Democratic Party, it's not going to come from the media, it can only come from the people, so that our obligation during the Bush years is to be critical, vigilant, and militant in trying to smoke out all of these scandals and get rid of Bush and force the system to change, that that's the only way change comes about. A service that the establishment to uh, people don't want any outsiders doing it. Well, what is the implication then of having an ex CIA director, the President of the United States? This is the first time that this has ever happened that someone who is so deeply involved in intelligence activities is actually the President. Well, it's a giant step towards the national security state is what it is. It's, it's a huge victory for the national security establishment. And always remember that although it's, it goes far beyond the CIA, but the CIA was created in the National Security Act of 1947. Uh, and the national security establishment has the CIA as the, sort of one of the inner chapters, so to speak and to have one of its directors bought into the thing totally and controlled by all of the illegal activities that he's been privy to and part of, uh, it, it means just that. We, we've been watching and worrying and people have been writing books for 15 years about the national security state and this is a giant step in that direction is what it amounts so to. So does that mean that the CIA will have much more influence in current uh, policy than they would have um, otherwise? And that Bush has this mentality, the sort of conspiratorial, covert action, interventionist uh, view of the world that these people um, have. How do you think that might translate practically into an increased role for the CIA? or increased influence on both. You get into some nuances or personalities, if you will. Mm -hmm. Overall, the establishment that the CIA represents is much stronger, having Bush as, uh, as president. Uh, however, it's difficult to imagine the CIA being more dominant and active than it was under William Casey, for mm -hmm. the simple right reason that the man was wild, as he, you know, Wild Bill Casey. Right. And uh, he was running poorly thought out, very aggressive operations in every corner of the world. Now, Bush has decided to go with William uh, on, in the FBI stuff. The Justice Department was investigating some of the mercenaries who had been involved in the CIA's Angola program. And they were asking us specifically which ones had worked for us and in what capacities. And uh, a young attorney showed up from the uh, general counsel's office responding to Bush's uh, supervision policies and actually went through my files and purged documents that he thought would be legally incriminating if we were uh, subpoenaed, you know, if we were in investigated. And all of that was uh, a thorough indication of Bush's policies as I witnessed them. Beyond that, we have a, an incredible record that we'll get into in greater depth as we chat here now of the connections that he picked up when he was CI director. So we have not only Noriega, but we have uh, uh, a dozen or dozens of Noriegas uh, who have blackmail control of this man. Now, one would like to give anyone the benefit of a doubt and say, hopefully, they're going to be more moderate. But this man even wished he to be uh, more moderate on CIA activities would have an uphill fight because that establishment has got so much dirt on him. And, and I personally don't believe he really has any desire or instincts to withdraw from them. I think he's, I think he sees a secret world that, that goes back to that uh, skull and bones thing at Yale, that kind of uh, secret elite manipulation, the Knights of Malta. I think he's, uh, I think psychologically he's just deeply committed to a view of the world where there's uh, elite insiders who are well above the normal laws of, of man and God. You look and see who's been the head of the CIA all these years and it's been people who've been right up at the, at the top and intermingled, interlocked with the top people in the American power structure. It seems that uh, 
that's such an important part, running an intelligence. I believe we do know a lot about this man. In fact, we know some things about him that are much more significant and frightening than what we knew about Ronald Reagan. Ronald Reagan was, of course, a committed conservative who, who, who was known to have a slightly defective mind. Who and had proved pretty, that that was the case. And proved it and lived up to and had some harsh policies when he was governor of California. But Bush, uh, the CIA directorship where he made these contacts, I worked for him. You know, I, I witnessed personally his supervising the CIA's covering up of illegal activity at the end of the Angola operation in early 1976. And he was actually fending off a hostile Congress. Instead of investigating and firing the perpetrators of crimes, he was fending off the FBI and the Congress on at least three or four major uh, CI criminal activities. What and, were those activities? Well, one was the Angolan operation, where we had broken a number of laws, much like the Iran-Contra and the Bolan kind of laws. And then we had conspired to cover up the breaking of the laws. And I mean literally, we sat around the big oak tables and discussed the law. We went down to the library and read up on the law. We, and then things like, uh, I remember one session reminding the boss, you know, don't contradict yourself. Or last week you said, you know, don't contradict yourself. This week if Senator so-and-so brings up a certain issue. And uh, this, this one, he just plowed right into that one, and he was just telling the Senate, you know, the Congress, I, I don't know, I wasn't here, but I'm sure that I just find it very difficult to believe, but we'll look into it thoroughly, if you'll just give me some slack, and he was reassuring them, and with, with you know, him patting him on the head, they uh, backed off and just never got back to it. He was also doing the same thing about the assassination of Patrice Lumumba, which was being investigated uh, in that cycle. Uh, and also the Chilean operation, the killing of, you know, the track one, track two, uh, ouster and killing of uh, Salvador Allende in Chile, and he was fending off an investigation of that. Hello, welcome to Alternative Views. We're very happy to have John Stockwell with us to discuss the implications of the election to the presidency of George Bush. We'll be discussing that with John today. John is a peace activist, a writer, a lecturer, an ex-CIA agent, and now a prominent critic of the CIA, who currently is working on two books, one on the Vietnam War and another on the arms race. He's also been commissioned by Oliver Stone to write a screenplay about Central America and has been very busy lecturing, traveling around the country and doing research since we last saw him on Alternative Views. So welcome back, John. <laughs> My pleasure. And it looks like our crew didn't show up, so I'm going to have to do a camera, be a camera <laughs> operator for all three cameras as well as participate in this. Okay, well jump in whenever you feel like it. Man right. of many talents. Right. This is like the old days. <laughs> So, John, I think everyone is concerned about what the election of George Bush will mean for American foreign and domestic policy and what a Bush presidency would be like. We're currently in the period, the honeymoon period, where all the media are just celebrating him, being nice to him, all the politicians are snookering up to him. So, let's give a critical perspective on the Bush presidency that we really haven't heard from our uh, corrupt uh, mainstream media. It's a tough one. This is, of course, the, the calm before the storm, perhaps. We have so little to go on. The man's been a vice president, uh, uh, politician. Uh, the responsible people say, give him a break. Let's wait and see right. what he does. Uh, my own position, and then they say, well, he is such a chameleon, but he could go either way, so to speak. And they point out that he was historically more moderate than Reagan, who has always had a wild hair up his nose. But I personally am more of the school that I Webster. A Webster is no saint. As the head of the CIA. As the head of the CIA, uh, which means, right? Yes, uh -huh, which, which means the head of the intelligence community, because the CIA director coordinates all of the intelligence right. in the seven uh, bureaucracies. Uh, Webster is no saint. It's not that you know that it makes you feel reassured. In fact, he ran COINTEL Pro Two in the FBI under Reagan when they were harassing the people who were supporting the the, the are lobbying against the Contras. 
And uh, he, but what, what's the most ominous thing about this man is that the establishment uh, exonerated him totally. He was permitted by the Congress, by the establishment, by the, the, the Washington Post media, uh, at the end of that thing when it was exposed of taking the idiots out, the stupidity out, the moron out of saying, well, it's true I was director of the FBI, but I wasn't aware of any of these activities. And, uh, you know, the Admiral's ship sinks, and he said, well, I wasn't aware it had a hole in the side. You it know, sounds like, like the Ronald Reagan uh, deficient management style was simply lying. And Bush, Bush used the same out. He sat in 17 meetings of the National Security Council in which they discussed the Iran-Contra scandal, and he says he doesn't remember their ever having talked about it. There was also another interesting thing that he said when they asked him about Oliver North on one of the TV things. He said, well, they made two or three mistakes. Hmm. The fact that it was all illegal <laughs> never yeah, even no. phased him. It didn't make any difference. See, back to Webster, though, it's, it's interesting to note that uh, two levels of the, the intelligence or national security establishment, not the, the community, uh, the hard, you know, the professional, the paid professionals, the on-duty professionals, but the community has spoken out at two levels uh, one, uh, at the Henry Kissinger level, they've gotten together and published a paper in which they have spelled out uh, policies that, that Bush should